Hola amigos. At the time when I'm recording this, it is 1.32 a.m. on November 6th. This is three days after the U.S. presidential election for 2020. And as of right now, we don't have a solid answer on who the next president of the U.S. is going to be. And for those of you tuning in maybe years from now, 2020 has been rough. 2019, 18, 17, and 16 were rough. And a lot of it has to do with who was president. So this is a conversation we're going to have because regardless of who ends up being the next president, we now have some valuable information about our friends and neighbors. And the real work is just beginning. So if you voted for the incumbent, this message is not for you. I'm not talking to you because you voted for someone who stands against the things that I'm going to talk about. And I know I'm not going to change your mind. So adios. This message is not for you. I'm not talking to you. Goodbye. For those of you who voted with the hopes of a better and more equal world, we got some work to do. Because while our hope was, I think, that this election would be a major turning point, it's been a close race. So unless you live in a major metropolitan area, you now know that almost half or maybe more than half of your neighbors and friends and people that you see every day are chill with racism and corruption, nepotism, racism, xenophobia, and racism. And it's time for us to acknowledge that racism isn't a problem, it is the problem. And even if our candidate wins, we are not going to be living in a post-racial society because there is nearly 50% of the country that didn't want this. If our candidate loses, we're definitely not in a post-racial society. So, what does that mean, practically speaking, for those of us who are white or white passing in spaces that are typically and historically have been open to white and white passing people? First off, know that your marginalized population, friends, family, followers on social media, acquaintances, people that you pass in the grocery store and squint your eyes at over your mask in hopes that they can see you smiling, are traumatized. This election told them that nearly half the country does not give a shit about them, and in fact, wants to actively harm them. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. You, as a white or white passing person, may or may not be traumatized on some level, but none of us can imagine what it's like to be a black person right now or to be an openly trans or gay person right now, unless we are there. And in that case, we need help. Okay. I am a white passing Latina, straight, cis, you know, so I generally am at like the highest tier of privilege in this country that a woman can be. Um, and so I feel that it is my job to do the work. I am not one of the more traumatized populations and I have the time and energy and affluence and position to make a change. And let me tell you what the results of this election nearly in, things are not gonna change unless we make them change. So it is time to do the work. We don't get to take a class for half a semester and be like, God, this is hard. I'm tired. I'm done doing the work. There are people that have been living this their entire lives. We don't get to be too exhausted to continue and press the outsides of our wrists to our foreheads and swoon on our Victorian settees. This is our time. So what can you practically do in your spaces to affect change? Um, 
This is specifically about living history in the in the video title because that's my main hobby. Um, so that's the space that I am operating within and able to affect. You know, I have enough history there and eh, history. Eh. I have enough, you know, time doing it and I know people and I fortunately know people who agree with me and think that things need to change. And so we can talk about making change. It's not that I'm dipping into a new community and being like, all right, I'm here to save you from yourselves. So that's what this is about because that's my life. But this can apply to any space where you have affluence and influence. So it could be your job. It could be costume. It could be LARPing or gaming or, I don't know, sports ball. I, I don't know what people do for fun. Do we do we do things for fun anymore? I don't know. So the big thing is that a lot of these hobbies that require time and a certain amount of wealth are very clicky. And it's not because necessarily people mean to be clicky. I don't know anyone who wakes up in the morning and is like, it's just going to be me and my squad and no one else can join us. Okay. Real life is not like mean girls. But if you think that the only thing you need to do to not be a click is to not act like the mean girls from mean girls, the bad news is that you're probably coming across as a click. In order to create a community, you have to be actioning. You have to be actively reaching out and you have to be creating that community with every move that you make. It needs to be tangible and visible and people need to feel the effects of it. So if you are not doing that, there is a good chance that people outside of that sphere of influence are not feeling like they can step into it. So what does that mean? You're going to need to be putting your money where your mouth is, particularly for hobbies that require equipment or ownership of specific clothing or uniforms or things like that. Um, if you are part of a group, this is a great time to talk about having loner gear. Um, my British unit has a loner uniform, but it's in very poor repair. So one of the things that I would like to be able to do is to mend that and freshen it up uh, and make it so that if someone wants to join us, it's actually nice enough that it means something to be like, we have this and you can use it. It's not just this raggedy ass thing that we dragged through the mud and I guess you can use it. Like that sends two very different messages. Um, invite people to things. And then much like going to parties in college, don't invite your friend to the party and then abandon them to go play beer pong. Okay. My idea in inviting somebody is that I am then responsible for them to have a good and positive experience at that event. So if that means that they're staying in my tent and I'm checking in with them every couple of hours to make sure that they've gotten hydrated and they're fed and all of that, that's what I'm going to do. Some people are more independent than that, but some people really need someone to be like, hey, I'm here with you. We're going to show you the ropes. What do you want to do? What do you want to learn? If they don't know, here's some ideas. Some people really need that person to come alongside them and to do that for them and to have that one-on-one, -on -one, not even mentorship, but just like an informal friend to open up that space for them. If you're in these hobbies and in these groups or organizations, you have access and that is what you can share. Even if you don't have a ton of pull in an organization, ask if you can bring a friend and then be dedicated to that friend. Um, if you do have the ability to provide them with things, that's great. Um, I, in particular, have like a bit of a dish problem. So for reenacting, I have lots of pottery. But that means that anyone I invite doesn't have to worry about bringing their own flatware and plates and cups and bowls, which can be expensive. You can spend $100 or more on dishes 
to eat a meal on. And a lot of reenactment meals are bring your own dishes. So that's something that over the years, I've been able to collect enough things that I can offer that to people. I just went and picked up a bunch of Windsor style, Windsor style chairs off Facebook Marketplace for real cheap. But that means that anyone I invite is going to have some place to sit. They don't have to stand around or sit on a straw bale or in the mud or whatever. So these little things can add up to helping people feel welcome in your group. But don't make them ask for it. You need to be out there talking to people, building rapport, building connection, and getting to a point with people where it's not charity because no one is going to want to join a hobby where you've got a white savior coming in and being like, I am now your patron and I'm going to shower you with gifts and you will be my pet. That's not cool either. So it's going to be a hard balance, but you need to be constantly going out and welcoming people or you're not going to come across as welcoming. So I've kind of had this on my mind for a while, but I think in the wake of what we now know about our country and that we can surmise about our friends, neighbors, and family of the marginalized populations, whether it's people of color or members of the LGBTQ plus community or women who <laughs> Trump has this, oh God, I wasn't going to say his name everybody who didn't vote red is mildly traumatized on one end or hella traumatized on the other end. And we can't fix that right away. But we can do what we can. And nothing's going to change unless we make it change. So you're tired. I'm tired. It's almost 2 a.m. and I'm making this video because it's important that no matter how tired we are, this is our time. This is where we become the change that we need to see in the world. Reach out to me. We'll talk about it. We'll have ideas. We'll meet people. We'll bring them in. We will love them. And if that's all we can do, that's still valuable. But we don't have to do it alone. I'm here. You're here. You're still watching this. Thank you. Let's do this.